Um, what I wanted to talk about today uh, is the idea that evidence-based uh, decision-making is threatened but by what I call the four horsemen of numeric knowledge resistance. I am defining numeric knowledge resistance fairly broadly because I wanted to bring up the point that there are different ways that people resist knowledge. And so we'll talk about four different ways that that ends up happening. But these four horsemen clip-clop into the heart of decision-making through innumeracy, affect richness, compelling stories, as well as through motivated numeracy, which is what Asa mentioned a moment ago. Um, and they influence decisions across domains. I often look in health domains, so you'll see some of my um, some of the research I'll present today will come from that domain. But I also look in different politically divisive domains and envir you know, environmental domains, even financial kinds of choices. Um, I'm going to talk about these four horsemen in turn and some possible ways that we can rein them in and rein in numeric knowledge resistance as, as, as a result. The four horsemen um, represent uh, essentially three different ways of resisting knowledge. The first one just has to do with not knowing numbers. So there are many people who lack skills with numbers. And when people lack skills with numbers, it means they don't comprehend numbers out in the world, of course. But it also means that there is a whole cascade of psychological processes that ensue that prevent them not just from not understanding, but from not using numeric information and using other information instead. The second way um, to resist numeric knowledge um, is just by being distracted by more salient information. And so we'll talk a bit about being distracted by affect richness by um, the compelling power of stories and what that does to our ability to use numbers. And then finally, we can have goals other than accuracy. And that's where I'll talk about motivated numeracy. But let's start first with enumeracy. How many people would you guess are, are quite enumerate in Sweden? I can tell you some data from the OECD. It turns out that about 15% of, of Swedish people can do only very, very simple processes with numbers. If you're thinking simple, think simpler again, because they can count, they can sort, they can um, do very simple arithmetic, and they can use simple percentages, like 50%. And they can't do much more than that, and they can't even do that if there's much distracting information around it. Just for comparison, because now I'd like you to feel better, that's a, that same number <laughs> is about 29% in the US. The US is actually considerably less numerate than Sweden. Um, this enumeracy ends up having consequences. Um, people who are enumerate may fail to appreciate the scope and the probability of, of changes, to, of, of things that happen due to climate change. Uh, they don't realize that the credit card debt will never be paid off at the current interest rate and minimum payments that they're currently paying. And they also might not be able to figure out in medicine, they might not be able to figure out when to take a missed medication dose, even something fairly simple like you were supposed to take your medicine an hour before lunch, and you forgot, and you're now eating lunch, and now you just have to simply figure out, based on the instructions on the prescription bottle, when, you're, when you can take it. And the prescription bottle tells you you can take it two to three hours after a meal. In the US, about 40% of Americans can't figure out how to do that. There are a fair number of people who are enumerate. And this kind of enumeracy can have consequences. So again, I often work in health domains, and these are some of the stories that, that people have told me. I miscalculated how long a prescription medication would last. I ran out of pills and I ended up very ill. I'd been diagnosed with cancer. The test result numbers were very confusing and I felt scared. So there, there are emotional consequences of not understanding numbers. What's interesting to me here is that um, these people are extremely educated. Education and numeracy are, are related, of course, but even very educated people can be, can be enumerate. Think about English PhDs that you know. Any English PhDs out there? Come on, any English PhDs out there? Um, but you can, think about, um, you can think about a lot of different majors where people will say, well, I'm really good at verbal things, for example, but I'm not, a, I'm not a number person. And I hear that fairly often at my university, and perhaps at yours. Um, in numeracy, um, th there ends up being important roles uh, in, in two ways for numeracy. One is through objective ability. And the other is actually through numeric confidence. And both that confidence and that ability end up making a difference um, in terms of lower science comprehension, in terms of higher risk perceptions, worse decisions that people make, and ultimately worse outcomes in financial and medical kinds of domains. 
We've been looking recently at objective numeracy as well as numeric confidence. Um, and if anyone's interested in talking about that later, we find an interesting interaction that essentially your objective numeracy matters to health and financial outcomes across the lifespan, but only, if, but only when you have numeric confidence. I'd be happy to chat with anyone about that later if you're interested. In terms of reigning in in numeracy, this is probably the, the, of the four horsemen, this is probably the area where we know the most about how to rein it in. Because there's all kinds of research that's been done, particularly in, in health-related kinds of domains, but where we can make strategic evidence-based choices of how to present numbers. Because if you present numbers in one way versus another, people are more and less likely to actually understand and be able to use those numbers. Um, and if you choose in an evidence-based strategic way, you can help people who are less numerate considerably more than people who are highly numerate. Uh, you can also support numeric confidence. Um, this, should help the, uh, th this should help the highly numerate, but it may actually hurt low ability people because it can actually end up in overconfidence. And people going out and making choices and taking actions when they don't necessarily have the ability to support those actions. The second um, of the four horsemen is the, the idea of affect richness. So in decision making, sometimes we can be faced with, um, with a choice between two outcomes that, that are fairly pallid. You're choosing between, I don't know, two calculators, say. Or other times, you can actually be faced with choices be um, or, or, or making judgments around something that's very affect rich, um, helping somebody who's in need of care. Um, uh, making a choice uh, for your child or for someone else's children. We, we can often end up in these situations where we're making choices that are very affect rich. And these emotional reactions to negative and positive outcomes um, can end up making a big difference to the extent to which we can actually use other numeric information. It turns out that when we rely on affect, when an outcome is very affect rich, and we end up relying on the affect from that outcome, we end up being sensitive to the presence or absence of it, so whether, uh, uh, but we end up being largely insensitive to, squo to scope, the quantitative aspect of a stimulus. We show what's called scope neglect, but, but let me show you an example. Um, and by the way, when we rely on deliberation instead, so when there's not much affect there, and we rely on deliberation, we tend to be more sensitive to scope. But let me show you an example. This, is, um, this actually comes from work by Chris Shee and Yuval Rottenstreich. Um, what they ended up doing in an experiment is that they showed people either a single panda and said that there were, uh, or, or uh, either showed them a single panda or showed them four pandas. And they told some little story about the pandas being in need of help. And they simply asked, how much would you be willing to donate either to the single panda or in a different group of, of subjects to four pandas? Now, of course, four is bigger than one, so you want to help four bigger than one, right? Except that you don't. People end up donating. Two <laughs> people end up donating about the same amount to one panda as to four pandas, but only in this condition, because this condition actually elicited emotional reactions from people. The pandas are really cute. In a different set of conditions, they gave the exact same story, but instead of showing a picture of one panda, they said, "This is a panda," so, and there's only one of them, <laughs> or "These are each pandas, and there's four of them." And how much would you be willing to donate to, to um, help save one panda or four pandas? And here, scope mattered. The affect richness of the of that, that comes from the pictures of those pandas is no longer there uh, to distract. And now, all of a sudden, people are willing to donate more to four pandas than they are to one panda, as they logically should have in the first place, except for the fact that affect was distracting. It turns out that affect richness can cause number neglect. It can cause us to neglect the number of things, the, the scope of the problem. Um, it also can uh, cause us to neglect time, whether something is happening for one year or four years time. And it can also end up causing probability neglect. And I'll show you an example here from our recent research. I've been doing research recently um, with uh, a, re a reconstructive surgeon uh, who looks at reconstructing breasts post-surgery. And um, she ended up being very interested in the idea that women who, who have breast cancer, cancer is often detected in one breast, and the choices that you can, the, the, the choices that the woman has at that time um, are generally a lumpectomy, a mastectomy, which means removal of a single breast, 
or or uh, uh, the, the mastectomy plus a contralateral prophylactic mastectomy. And what that means is you are prophylactically removing the second breast at the same time as the first breast. One of the things that is um, that that's interesting, and I and I use the word interesting in um, m maybe not an appropriate way, but one of the things that's interesting is that uh, CPM, this contralateral prophylactic mastectomy, I, uh, the the use of it has been rising in the U.S. quite a bit over the last ten years. So about ten years ago, the rate was about two or three percent. So among women um, who had cancer detected in one breast, they would actually have both breasts removed. And then uh, over the course of 10 years, that rose uh, to about an average of about 17%, which is a very large rise, because this is quite an invasive surgery. Um, what's perhaps more important in this situation is that the, the biggest rise in the rate of women who are getting this, this CPM, contralateral prophylactic mastectomy, was among women who were at very low risk for breast cancer in the second breast. They actually had no familial risk. They had no genetic risk. And in fact, they would be specifically told, not only do you not have that risk, but um, th the difference in your survival rate, whether you get a mastectomy or a double mastectomy, the difference in that your survival rate is zero. There is no known survival rate for getting the, the, this, second, um, this second quite invasive surgery. And so it ends up being a very interesting problem. Um, it turns out that among these women, knowledge about CTM is actually quite low. So it's been tested, and women just simply don't understand that much about it, even though they've been told about it. You might imagine this might be an affect-rich situation. And the women, um, they, they often walk away without really remembering, perhaps even without having heard a lot of the information that's important to know when you're making a critical choice like this. And of course, emotion to cancer is quite high. Surgeons say they're operating on anxiety. And they question um, whether it's even ethical. Now, you can actually argue that this kind of surgery, even with no known survival benefit, you can actually argue that this kind of surgery is nonetheless ethical because, um, because women feel anxious and they think that if, if they have the, the, the more extensive surgery that it'll get rid of that anxiety. It may help their body image because it's, their, their bodies are more balanced then. Except that the data that we have so far, and we don't have a lot of it, but the data we have so far suggests that there are no anxiety differences afterwards, and there are no body image differences afterwards. And so while they think at the moment of choice that it might make a difference, it doesn't seem to make a difference. It just seems to be the case that at least among this subset of women, again, no familiar risk, no genetic risk, at least among this subset of women, they're simply taking on a more invasive surgery without any survival benefit. We think it's because of affect or emotion, but there's actually no causal evidence of whether emotion actually plays any kind of a, uh, makes any kind of a difference. So what we think happens, and what surgeons think happen, this is sort of a, a fairly widely, widely held belief, is that women who are more afraid of breast cancer, they're worried about it, that they may end up being the ones who are mistakenly, in a sense, mistakenly choosing um, CPM. So we decided to test it. So, so far we've done just a hypothetical study. We have a whole series of studies planned after this. But we did a hypothetical study where we manipulated affect towards uh, breast cancer in a large sample of healthy women who are aged 30 to 59. And what we did is we uh, randomly assigned them either to a negative affect condition. I felt alone in my fear. Friends and family would try and ease the pain by saying there's a cure. Breast cancer is the best kind of cancer to have. And you'll be fine. My sister, cousin, hairdresser had it and she survived. Each time I politely nodded my head, thinking to myself, you're not the one with breast cancer. You don't know what will happen to me. And these scenarios, by the way, were accompanied by a lot of information about, the breast, can about breast cancer and a lot of information about each of the three options for treating breast cancer. The scenarios themselves we pulled from, from um, survivor experiences. So these are anecdotes that, that real women, we, we modified them a little, but these are essentially um, anecdotes that, that real women talked about. In the second condition, um, it, it was less negative. Uh, so after two long days waiting for my biopsy results, they confirmed it was cancer. I couldn't cry because I knew deep down that it was. But I knew then and there that I had to be ready to fight, and I wasn't going to back down no matter how bad it was. And so we manipulated these women's affect towards breast cancer. Again, this is hypothetical. I actually. Um, we talked about doing this with, with patients very briefly and very clearly decided that this was not something we would be doing with actual patients. Um, what we're going to be doing with actual patients is we'll be measuring um, all of these various variables that I'll talk about 
in um, ju just simply within patient surgeon encounters, but we'll be doing that later. So in this, hy again, hypothetical study, what we ended up finding is that um, women who are uh, randomly assigned to the negative condition versus the less negative condition, they of course had more negative affect to breast cancer. That's simply our manipulation check. They also had greater perceptions of future cancer risk because affect acts as information to, to help people understand risks and, and to further, to increase risk perceptions. But then here's the most interesting part. It actually caused more hypothetical choices of contralateral prophylactic mastectomy. Women who were assigned to the negative condition uh, were 27% uh, of them chose CPM compared to only 19% of those who were in the less negative condition. Despite no survival benefit, the affect towards breast cancer appeared to cause them to neglect what's essentially a zero probability of survival, uh, a zero probability difference in terms of survival. So affect richness can distract. It can distract us away from other information that at least is relevant and perhaps is even more important at least some of the time. Um, in terms of reining in affect richness, um, there are some things that can be done. We actually don't know a ton about how to do this. However, you can do things like tr try to choose the level of a, emotion if it's appropriate. Now remember, anytime you're dealing with emotion, there's a excuse me, there's of course manipulation potential here. So you always have to think carefully through the ethical ramifications of this. Um, but we know, for example, with surgeons, um, surgeons are often, particularly um, surgeon, well, pretty much any surgeon, but, but the data I know of come from cancer. Surgeons are often dealing um, with people who are, uh, not surprisingly, very emotional about what's going on. They're faced with um, mortality. They're faced with some very difficult choices, and they're very emotional. And it does turn out that does turn out that if surgeons and other physicians respond empathically to an emotional expression from a patient, the patient's anxiety goes down. And in fact, there are ways, we're just starting to understand how to do it, but there are ways to teach surgeons how to respond more empathically, and that does seem to make a difference to patient emotion. So that is one way that you can um, that you can think about in a medical encounter of, of choosing a level of emotion appropriately. It's not that you're really choosing it. It's just simply that um, if a essentially if a surgeon treats a patient as more human and less as a number on the table, that, the, that, that women respond. They, they end up being less afraid. Um, there's always the question with emotion of does a right level exist? And I would say that most of the time there's not a right level. There's a level, but how you communicate influences what that level is. And so whatever you do is going to influence what that level is, and you should at least choose mindfully rather than mindlessly. Um, there are ways to, um, to rein in affect richness through numeric formats. You can reduce people's emotional responses in different ways by choosing different evidence-based strategies for information presentation. You can use icon arrays. Um, you can use experiential presentations of data. Uh, an example that I like to use of this, uh, in the United States at least, um, people have started talking a lot about um, providing calorie counts on menus. It turns out that those numbers end up not having much impact. However, if you, 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 you can make a choice about how you present those calorie counts, of course. You can either say that it's, um, and I'm going to make up some numbers here because I don't remember the right numbers, but you can either say that th this cookie is going to, um, it has 250 calories, or you're going to have to walk for two hours briskly to get rid of the calories from this single cookie, a much more experiential way of presenting those numbers. Same information, if I had the math right, which I'm sure I don't. But if you do it right, it's the same information, um, but it's a more experiential way of presenting it. Uh, you can also, um, oftentimes when people see numbers, and especially in very unfamiliar situations, they can know that it's a nine, but have no idea how good or bad that nine is. OK, I have a nine risk. Is that good? Is that bad? Oftentimes people don't know. And so you can use things like evaluative categories, which is simply putting an affective stamp on the data by telling people this is a, a good, fair, poor, excellent risk or whatever. The next of the, the four horsemen is the idea of compelling stories, because compelling stories can distract. Um, stories can capture attention, evoke emotion, reduce counter-arguing, and entrance listeners in a way that reduces resistance to a message. 
for decision makers who are in limited cognitive budgets, and really all of us are if you think about it. For all of us, using intuitive heuristics is tempting, and one of the ways that, uh, one of the tempting heuristics is the use of stories, to go along with the story or narrative that you're being told. Um, these kinds of compelling stories are often about outcomes, and it causes neglect of statistics and other kinds of information. We'll talk about a couple of other ways you could tell stories instead of telling stories about outcomes in a minute. Um, this is an example of a paper from Derek Rucker and one of his colleagues. Um, and they did, um, it, it, they did a really interesting study where they um, told people about either weak or strong facts. And then they gave people either just the facts, that's in the dark bar, or they gave the facts embedded in a story about outcomes. And uh, the, the story itself had to do with, with a cell phone and whether a cell phone was used to save somebody, essentially. Um, and then the facts, of course, were about how good, or, you know, how, how good was the cell phone. Um, he, the, the, this paper to me was really interesting because of, of how he interpreted it versus how I interpreted it. Um, and and I'll, I'll tell you just my interpretation for now, which is simply that if you embed facts in a story and you have weak facts that perhaps you shouldn't, that indicate that perhaps you shouldn't choose this cell phone, or you have strong facts that really kind of push you towards, yeah, this is a really good phone, if it's embedded in a story, it doesn't matter <laughs> because the story is all that matters. If you tell just the facts only, people are able to take into account those facts and they, um, they respond much more strongly to weak evidence versus strong evidence. Stories can be quite distracting. They can take you away from the information that's probably much, in this case certainly, was much more relevant to the choice that was at hand. Um, with the story, mes the message is processed more. Uh, the message was processed more superficially in this case, also. So, in terms of thought listing, uh, what they did is they asked people to just list their thoughts about why um, they had this attitude about a phone versus that attitude about a phone. And when um, when stories are told in these two cases in the lighter bars, they simply didn't list as many thoughts. They didn't think about it as hard because they had the story, and so they went with the story instead. Like affect, stories can, of course, be used strategically for better or for worse. Um, in advertising, advertising often tells the story of a product. And that kind of those kind of advertising stories can be distracting. It can help the person who is doing the advertising, but it might distract you away from whether that product is a high or low quality. Um, there was a snowball thrown on the, the Senate floor by a US senator. Um, he ignored available statistical information and he simply talked about recent cold days to argue global warming was a hoax. This happened on the floor of our Senate. I am not proud. <laughs> but there it is. Um, Trump has said recently, Trump tells a lot of stories you might have noticed. Uh, the border is wide open for cartels and terrorists. Secure our border now. Build a massive wall and deduct the costs from Mex Mexican foreign aid. He is a master at telling stories and distracting people from the facts. Stories can be used to denigrate politically inconvenient truths. They can be used in an extremely strategic manner and fan fear of even unlikely threats. So what can we do about it? This one is actually fairly difficult, and it's fairly difficult in part because even highly numerate people faced with a story and faced with uh, nu uh, numeric information will often go with the story because stories are really compelling. Um, there are ways maybe that would work, uh, and some of these have been tested and have been shown to work more with the highly numerate than with the less numerate, but all of the effect sizes are fairly small. You can make base rates more salient, the, the likelihood that something's actually going to happen. You can tell people, um, let's see, actually the rest of these have not been tested, but I think will work at least to some extent, um, but probably again only with the highly numerate. You can tell people to think like a scientist. And that presumably will shift um, at least highly numerate people who at least know how to use the numbers, shift them over into a more deliberative mode. This works um, in general as a main effect, and I suspect it would work more with the highly numerate. Um, you can simply introduce something, some, uh, a problem as, as being statistical, again, to kind of prime that idea of deliberation. Um, when you give people repeated questions or tasks, they're also more likely to notice the pattern and start to think more deliberatively. 
Uh, and then finally, you can ask people essentially to think about the opposite of what they're currently thinking. Generate reasons for why the other, which happens to be correct option, was actually the right answer. And again, you can get people to think more numerically, and particularly people who are highly numerate. But this one's hard. Reining in compelling stories is difficult. Um, you can also try empathic communication. This also has not been tested, um, but trying to meet people more where they are right now. Um, things like, I, you know, if you think about the breast cancer example, um, having a surgeon say, I, I can understand your worry. You've been through so much and the situation must feel so uncertain. So, so to kind of try to meet somebody where they are and then introduce more, in, uh, then introduce new information. Uh, there's work from McGuire back in the 1950s that would suggest that this should work. Um, there are also different types of stories. So generally, um, when we hear about the power of, of compelling narratives, it is about the outcome. It's about the polar bear floating on the, uh, on the, on the disappearing ice. It's about um, the, the child who, who's hurt in Africa. Uh, it's, it's often about an outcome narrative, and that, and that does seem to cause bias. It causes people to neglect information. But there are other kinds of stories that can be told. You can, you can think about um, writing process narratives. So a process narrative would, would be one where you walk people in a story, you walk people through someone's process of making a decision. And that's been tested within the medical decision-making literature, and it seems to, um, to improve information um, search as well as information use. Uh, you can instead do um, experience narratives where, again, you, you, you're, you're not focused on the outcome, but you're focused on the experience of going through the decision itself. And each of these can, um, can end up um, helping people, helping to improve the decision-making process. Our fourth horseman is the one that Asa actually talked about first. Uh, she talked about the idea of motivated numeracy, and this does come um, from work I've done with Dan Kahan, uh, although there's been other work uh, done on it in the meantime as well. So the highly numerate, um, as they go through life, seem to have numeric accuracy more often as a goal than people who are less numerate. And so you see them, again, not just understanding numbers better, but they also um, they, they use numbers more. They, they, they're they more likely to do num uh, number operations, like comparing numbers, calculating um, some kind of a probability transformation, for example. They, they, they go into life knowing numbers but also having it primed for them, in a sense, um, to use numbers uh, in judgments and decisions that they make. And that idea of numeric, accu the, and I numeric accuracy seems to be one of their primary goals. But people who are highly numeric can also use their numeric hammer in quest of, of reaching, of attaining other goal states, because accuracy is not the only goal that we have in life. Um, in a study that, that, um, that, that uh, Dan, myself, Erica Dawson, and Paul Slovic did, uh, we showed that um, in a gun control experiment that you could see uh, politically motivated processing and a motivated processing that was actually stronger for the highly numerate than for the less numerate. I'll, I'll show it to you briefly. Um, the experiment had two different sides to it. One was in, do you guys know this already? You may already know. Okay, a few people haven't. Not everybody. Not everybody. So for those of you who are nodding, just close your eyes for a minute, and let me explain it to just a few people. And, I, and I'll do it briefly. Hopefully this will be enough of an explanation, because uh, I don't want to bore people. Um, th there are two sides of the experiment. There's basically a, a neutral side of the experiment, and there's a politically motivated side of the experiment. This is the neutral side. And so what um, it's actually a fairly simple experiment. What you do it, on the neutral side here, you tell people about a story about uh, th this new cream that exists for, for, for treating some skin rash, and um, they did a study on it, and what they found was, uh, and, and for, for um, some of the patients, um, they gave them this new skin cream, and some of the patients, they didn't give them the new skin cream. And then they just tracked, they just looked to see what happened, if they gave them the skin cream or didn't. And it turns out that um, skin creams, like anything else in life, is not perfect. And among those who did use the skin cream, some got better and some got worse. And among those who didn't use the new skin cream, again, some got better and some got worse. And um, in, in the end, all we did is we asked people, um, well, what did the skin cream do? Did it work or not work? And that was essentially it. They, they just chose um, one of two questions. People who use the skin cream were more likely to get better than those who didn't or were more likely to get worse. So in the end, this is just a math problem. It's a little two by two table of numbers. And it's a difficult one, by the way, but it's just a two by two table of numbers. And it turns out, not super surprisingly, that people who are highly numerate um, respond correctly more often because they're good at math and this is a math problem. 
But then there's the other side of the experiment. This is the, the gun control side of the experiment. Um, if you're looking really carefully, you'll notice this table is identical to the table on the page before, except that there's a different story wrapped around it. So it's also, again, it is simply a math problem. But now the math problem has to do with cities that, um, that banned concealing, uh, care, excuse me, cities that banned carrying concealed handguns in public and cities that did not ban that same thing. And whether, and the result being either a decrease in crime or an increase in crime. Um, in this case, it is a very politically um, divisive issue in the United States, uh, again, for better or for worse. Um, and what seems to happen is that the highly numerate appear to flexibly do one of two simpler processes now to get them to, um, to, get them to what, what they would like to see. Um, what ends up happening in the end is that people who are highly numerate, if the correct answer agrees with what they want a priori, then they're more likely to get the correct answer, just like in the skin cream problem. But if the correct answer does not agree with what they want ahead of time, so for example, a liberal... Um, if a, a liberal looking at this problem where the correct answer is that um, uh, increasing gun, ban, gun bans uh, would, actually increasing, would actually increase crime, that would be counter to what a liberal would think, they're much less likely to find the correct answer. And in fact, people who are highly numerate were 45 percentage points um, more likely to get the right answer if the data backed up their views than if it didn't. You see a huge political divisiveness there. As if numeracy was, in a sense, turned off and on based on political motivations. There are, there's another um, very interesting motivated math effect that's been shown recently. So the, the, problem, the, the gun control problem that I showed you a second ago um, suggests that people um, process information differently depending upon their political motivations. There's a very nice study done by Leif, ba Leif Van Boven, Paul Slovak, and some of their colleagues looking instead um, at the idea that what numbers are considered important in the first place changes depending upon political motivations. Um, what they were looking at was a Muslim immigration ban in the US and which probabil what probabilities um, are important to consider for, um, for making policy on, on, on banning uh, Muslim immigration. Uh, so, for example, in this particular case, and I'll show you the data in a second, supporters of the ban rated the likelihood of terrorist immigrants being Muslim. So the probability of terrorist immigrants being Muslim, uh, that's a high probability, as more important than the chances of Muslim immigrants being terrorists, which is a very low probability. So these are different conditional probabilities. And they're actually, they, they sound very much the same and they're very different from one another. Um, opponents of the ban provided the opposite importance ratings. Here are the data um, uh, from Leaf's study. Um, this is the probability of, this is just the probability of asylum seekers, a base rate. This is the probability of criminals, of, of someone being a criminal. This is a prob the probability of someone being a criminal given that they're an asylum seeker, and the probability of someone being an asylum seeker given that they're a criminal. And then the, the two, and then the, the light bars are those who oppose the ban, and the uh, black bars are those who support the ban. And what you can see essentially is that um, these two base rates, the probability of an asylum seeker and probability of a criminal, were not chosen by particularly many people, and I'm going to ignore those. What ends up being important um, is this one. So of asylum seekers, how many were criminals? So of the people who are, who are seeking out asylum, how many of them were criminals? This is actually a very low number. And when asked which of these numbers is the most important, someone who opposes the ban on immigrants picks out this very low number as being much more important than someone who supports it. The opposite happens if you take a look at the probability the probability that an asylum uh, the probability that an is sorry, given that someone's a criminal, the probability that they're an asylum seeker. Now this suddenly is a very high number, and um, the, the people who pick this are the people who support the ban as if they are strategically choosing low and high numbers that support what they want to believe in the first place. And so this kind of motivated numeracy seems to happen not just in terms of the processing of, of numbers, the ability to do math in a sense, but it also um, alters what you see as important numbers to consider in the first place and what you see as unimportant numbers. And by the way, you see bigger effects among the highly numerate. 
News anchor Megyn Kelly once asked uh, Karl Rove, is this just math that you do as a Republican to make yourself feel better? Motivated numeracy seems to happen. Um, as a result, greater numeracy can be associated with be better reasoning sometimes, but worse, uh, worse, uh, excuse me, worse reasoning other times. The highly numerate seem to use their numeric ability strategically to meet their needs. And guess what? That's because all of us use our abilities strategically to meet our needs. And that is no more or less different, it seems, for the highly numerate as for anybody else. Um, Though salient needs are often numeric accuracy for the highly numerate, in fact, it's more likely to be for the highly numerate than for the less numerate, but they have other needs at sometimes um, than accuracy. And so when it comes to motivated numeracy, one of the big questions, for, to me at least, is when do people choose an accuracy goal versus some other goal, like belonging to their own tribe? We actually don't know, in my opinion, don't know very much about that, but need to. Um, the strength of the association between whatever the, the political issue is and the person's ideology seems to be important. So there was a nice study done, and I'm afraid I forget the author's names at the moment, um, but it, in one study, when there is a less polarizing policy, uh, when one political party made a numeric political appeal, the highly numerate were simply more accurate. So this was a case where you, you have a, a, a politically divisive issue, not very politically divisive, but a little bit, um, and yet nonetheless the highly numerate chose an accuracy goal and acted upon an accuracy goal. The less numerate relied instead on the political party cue. And this kind of a finding is much more consistent with the numeracy literature at large. Because in the numeracy literature at large, what you see is the highly numerate use the numbers, and the less numerate are much more likely to use other generally non-numeric information, whether it's about the frame of a problem, a story, a compe compelling affective reaction, um, or in this case, a political party cue, uh, pr pr political party ideology. And so this result is much more um, in line with the rest of the numeracy literature. And so and what, it's, what it suggests is that there's some kind of a counterpoint, some kind of a balancing point um, where goals of accuracy versus some other kinds of goals take over. And I think we need to know more about exactly when that happens and what are the conditions that cause that to happen. Uh, in terms of reining in motivated numeracy, I think we don't understand very much and we need to understand more, starting with how are goals primed or chosen? Can we get them to switch within a particular situation? It could be that increasing accuracy deliberations maybe could help. I'm not convinced of this because remember the highly numerate in a very politically divisive domain um, used these, deliberative act th th these deliberations um, to choose more politically. Um, but you know, maybe you could help them identify the correct analytical procedure, like thinking like a scientist, um, asking them to consider the opposite. Uh, Dan has Dan Kahan has some nice work on um, the idea that maybe increasing science curiosity would work. Um, I don't think he has any experimental results there yet. He has only correlational results, so we'll see what ends up happening. Um, but the the question with increasing science curiosity um, is uh, is it going to be possible to do? Will we be able to manipulate it, get someone to be more curious, and reduce excuse me reduce political divisiveness? And if we're able to do so, for whom would those kinds of manipulations work, and for whom would they not? Because you figure it's not going to work for everybody, and will it help? Will it increase science curiosity in the way that we would want it to? Um, Values affirmation uh, is a manipulation that comes from social psychology that gets people to think about bigger, bigger, better values of the, for themselves. Um, in essence, it, it um, gets them to think about things that are way more important in their lives, and they become less defensive about concrete information that's in front of them. There seem to be three ways to resist numeric knowledge, and we've talked about uh, we've talked about four horsemen that underlie those three ways. Um, one is not knowing numbers, one is being the second is being distracted by more salient information, and the final one is having goals other than accuracy. In any one given information, I'd claim that we're not always sure exactly what is going on in terms of someone who is um, resisting numeric knowledge. We don't know for sure whether it's because they simply don't know numbers or whether it's be, they're being distracted by more salient information or possibly both. And understanding more about um, 
different ways that someone might resist numeric knowledge and being open to the idea that in any given situation, you may have people falling into each of these camps, I think is important to understand because we might need different solutions based on each one of them. So what we have is innumeracy and scientific illiteracy. We have misinformation and fake news. Um, and that misinformation and truthiness and fake news can be affect rich, story rich, and politically divisive and motivating as a result. What we need is information that's presented effectively. It's not always gonna work, but we need information that's presented effectively. We need stories that promote the use of information rather than stories that simply are compelling and get someone to do something. Um, because we want evidence-based decisions and because we want to improve quality of life and of course improve societal welfare. In terms of reigning in the four horsemen, um, I have just, uh, th this is just simply a, a reiteration of what I said before, but we have these four horsemen and there seem to be different strategies that can be used to kind of rein in each of the four horsemen, some of which overlap from one to the other. So to wind up, numeric knowledge resistance happens, but it doesn't happen just for one reason. It happens for multiple reasons. Um, and the solutions for reining in those four horsemen likely differ. And so, so that we need to be choosing, we need to be understanding how they work better so that we can therefore be able to better choose how to overcome them. Um, we don't know how to identify rich, which reason is underlying which reason, which um, instance of resistance. And so we need to know more about how to diagnose the situation at hand. Why is it that you are being resistant to knowledge versus you're being resistant to knowledge? It may be for different reasons. What the scientific data say should be, sh uh, sh what the scientific data say should be independent of what you prefer the scientific data to say. But of course, they're not independent. Um, solving knowledge resistance is going to require supporting num numeric understanding and use because guess what? Math is the language of science. We need to be able to use numeric information to make good evidence-based choices. At the same time, um, we're going to need to be able to reduce motivated reasoning, and that's something we know much less about. We probably need multiple solutions, and we definitely need better solutions for motivated reasoning. Um, and we also need to know how to, again, how to select best strategies based on individual differences, but also situational factors that seem to bring out more of one of these horsemen versus the other. Thank you. No? Yes, we have it. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yep. Yeah, so the, uh, the question is, um, can compelling stories be used to explain uh, why people gamble? Um, and... Uh, you know, in, in the United States, we have um, actually a, st a state sanctioned lottery. And I think it's the state of Oregon where I live now that says, uh, you can't win if you don't play. And, and then they have all kinds of stories about people who have played and won. And, and it's exciting and it's, um, and so my guess is yes. Uh, in fact, there's some data, again, this comes from the state of Oregon, that the people who are most likely to play the lotto, lotto are um, more likely to be poor, uh, less educated and female mothers for uh, single moms for some reason. I don't know why the last one. Um, so yeah, I think you're probably right. Um, um, so I don't happen to know anything other than what I what I just told you about. I've never really looked at gambling before, uh, but it would make a lot of sense from all kinds of perspectives. I do know from some of our unpublished data that if you just simply ask people, are you more likely, uh, how likely are you to do various kinds of gambling activities, people who are less numerate are much more likely to do all kinds of gambling activities, whether it's buying a lottery ticket, um, going to Las Vegas, um, uh, playing a poker game for money. Applying. <laughs> no, that's motivated numeracy. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Levi Spector. Hi. Nice to meet Thank you. Thank you for your um, for your talk. I was wondering if you um, looked at the problem that is uh, in legal theory 
that seems to be the opposite of the problem that you're talking about. So across jurisdictions, uh, both uh, in, in liability cases but in, and in criminal law, you cannot use statistical evidence to indict someone. It cannot, not as a standard, not even, in, in most cases it's not even um, uh, accepted as uh, evidence at all. So just for instance, uh, the famous case is uh, John was at a rodeo and he stopped on the way out um, um, and, and, um, and uh, he's in court on the basis of the fact that only 10% of the audience bought a ticket. Um, well, he will not be um, uh, indicted in, in, uh, on, on that basis, although a, on an uh, eyewitness who is only 80% accurate, he will be. And this is um, something that is, I mean, also intuitive, not only that, uh, but uh, with a, a, a price that we're willing to pay in accuracy, if there is one, um, and it seems like the the right thing to do, not the wrong thing to do. And I was wondering if you, if you what you, what you would have to say about cases like that. So I would want. So why do you think it's the right thing to do? Well, that's the intuition. That's w it's uh, it's it's extremely. Um, um, wha I ha I have my own theory about this, so I, yeah. I don't want to promote it right here. But <laughs> <laughs> but now I'm curious. <laughs> I think it's the it gives the wrong incentive if you if you ch if you um, if you would the law would give the wrong incentive if it accused uh, people on the basis of uh, statistical evidence because I could see that okay so if yeah. John was deciding to buy a ticket or not then uh, if he would be accused anyhow if uh, he has no incentive to to comply with the law so the law cannot give that kind of incentive that's I mean most people don't like my theory, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> just telling you, <laughs> warning you in, <laughs> in advance not to, but that, uh, uh, so uh, of course you have to look at, I mean, I, I'm just wondering yeah. what you would say about the, the fact that many times we're advised to ignore statistical evidence yeah. uh, uh, and, um, and even pay a price in accuracy, but for a decision theoretic uh, reasons, n not for the question of what you believe. I can't advise you not to believe that John Gate crashed. He, 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 he probably did. It's 90% likely that he did. Yeah. So, um, wh uh, and, and in many of the cases, you seem to equate the decision on the basis of numeric um, uh, data with the question of what people should believe on the basis of numeric data. And those two things need to, I think, many times to be separated, particularly because the incentives, uh, you know, the, cho the choice structure is different. Yeah, so I mean, so, so you're basically asking, what b basically what you're saying is that within a, a legal framework um, that there are, it, it certainly happens and, and perhaps there are some, some good reasons for ignoring statistical evidence. Um, in the kinds of decisions, so, so I've never worked within the legal domain. Um, I'm not sure I would agree with your argument either, <laughs> but I'd be curious about your paper, actually, if it's in English. <laughs> if it's in Swedish, not as much, it won't help. <laughs> um, so coming, uh, so again, I'd mostly do my research, excuse me, in medical decision making, and I am a strong believer in the use of numeric evidence. Um, I guess I am not as sure within a legal domain, because I have not thought about it very much. Um, what I can tell you descriptively in a legal domain is that you see similar effects in a legal domain as in other domains, where if you have vivid information versus numeric information, you get differences in judgments depending upon whether someone's highly numerate or less numerate in the way that I described. So the people, if, you, if you're thinking about DNA evidence, for example, people who are highly numerate are going to be more likely to use the DNA evidence. People who are less numerate will be more likely to use it a um, a nice descriptive narrative about the lab technician and how he went how he went about his work, um, and so I'm I'm not dealing with the the fundamentals of your question because I fundamentally disagree with that in law I guess um, I, I I I have never been able to get myself to believe in ignoring numeric evidence when it seems to produce a more logical reason a more logical answer. 
um, if you are more likely to be correct if you go with the numbers. Um, so yeah, so I'm, I, I'm not quite sure what to say to it because I, I haven't really thought much in that domain. It's not my area of work. Yeah, again, only in English. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, hello. Catherine hey. Glue, thanks for that. Nice to meet you. Very interesting. Um, I was wondering about the, the model reasoning studies. As yeah. far as I have seen, in all these studies, uh, participants are exposed to one of the four conditions. Yep. Has anyone, so the question, one of the questions, has anyone ever tried? running each participant through one neutral and one um, partisan uh, mm -hmm. condition. I mean, you could change yep. the numbers and see whether that has any effect. Yep. Also, there might be an ordering effect. If you do yep. the neutral first, you might do better on the <laughs> yep. polarized one later, things like that. Has yeah. that been tested? So, so there have been a few things that have been done. There's one study by uh, Laura Shearer where she did not exactly what you're saying, but she instead had people do um, a repeated series of of different um, of different problems where the numbers changed, and there what she finds is that the effects flip and that the, the highly numerated are more likely to go with an accuracy a more accurate decision, and that would um, be consistent with what I was talking about in terms of getting people to think more like a scientist, essentially. Um, people aren't stupid. <laughs> they, you know, they, they react to the information at hand, but they react to all, to they oftentimes, and especially highly numerate people, will react to all the information at hand and they'll, they'll notice along the way. Uh, with Dan, we have not published this yet, but we also did another version of the skin cream gun control problem, where we um, had half the people do the skin cream problem first, and then the gun control, and then half did the gun control problem first, and then the sk and then the skin cream, which, which I think is exactly what you're talking about. And there, what you say is that y what you see is that. Um, Motivated reasoning doesn't go away. So people who are, um, I forget exactly how we measured it, but people who are more conservative still are more likely to choose the answer that agrees with them. People who are more liberal are still more likely to choose the answer that agrees with what they think a priori. But the motivated numeracy effect goes away. And so suddenly, people who are high for, for people who are highly numerate, they don't show any more motivated reasoning than people who are less numerate. They also don't show less. Um, but it so it gets rid of part of the problem. Yeah, yeah. And hopefully we'll publish that someday soon. We're a little behind. <laughs> okay, now we have a lot of We have Gordon. That was a great segue into the question. Yeah. I'm curious about the connection between the horsemen, right? That it is the motivated numeracy effect um, an affect uh, effect, right? Is it, does, it, does it emerge because of the affect richness aspect? Um, might be that. In the experiment you just described, the part of the reason why it doesn't is because you see the screen, skin cream, and then that kind of pulls the kind of affect part out of it a little bit because you know that math problem or more of a math problem uh, than, yeah. than otherwise. Yeah. It, it's a good question. Uh, so we've never we've never attempted to measure it uh, in terms of, of an affective reaction. I would guess it's more complicated than that. If you think about the the tribe with with whom you belong, um, there certainly is an emotional richness there, but there's a lot more going on. Um, there's all kinds of cognitive associations over time, connections, and so I would expect it goes um, it goes beyond just an emotional reaction, but I don't know for sure. For for reasons that I'll explain in my talk, I think that it would go away. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> See, advertising works. <laughs> Thanks. These questions are really great. Eric? Oh, hey, I'm here. Uh, <laughs> just a quick follow-up uh, on the last ones. If you put them together, side by side, forget about order effects. If you just have... Oh, um, yeah. Because then you can have a very clear idea of how much people want to weigh the mathematical information to begin with. Do you have any idea of how people... Put, uh, put, them si put the skin cream problem and the gun control problem side by side? Yeah, yeah. So that you realize that the tables are identical, right? Yeah. yeah okay. But, <laughs> but do you know that... You, you can't, uh, we actually do in, in what I told you about, we even do change the numbers slightly. So it's not exactly identical. Yeah, so just one, cu a couple of control questions. Do you ha yeah. ask people for what their reasoning is and do you check whether they realize? Because I it's clear that the ones that are numerically um, sophisticated should presumably realize the ratios are the same, but the it's not clear that, that they are doing that. And if you put them side by side, then presumably they're forced to reckon with yeah. the idea that. So do you have any clue how they respond? Because it would go some way to... Or if you've tried that variation. Right, so, so haven't tried that variation. Um, I would expect it would work similar to the order effect study that I, that I told you about a minute ago. 
um, maybe a little more strongly, maybe, maybe then you would get the highly numerate being less politically motivated as they really saw that the stark similarity between the two, but I don't know for sure. And I just wanted to Be ask. I'm sorry, but just real quick. And the reason I don't know for sure is that um, people who, we can also pick out information that we think is more and less important. Y you know, even realizing what the right answer is, we can pick out information that we think is more and less important. We can decide whether information is more or less trustworthy. And if I had to guess, there's some of that going on in this problem too. Um, although we didn't pick up on it when we've, when we've asked in a roundabout way a couple of times. And I just wanted to know if it was a significant effect on your earlier slide where you had the uh, um, story versus numbers. For the, I can't remember who is a. Uh, oh, the Derek Rucker study. Yeah, the. Rucker oh, yeah, yeah, that was definitely significant. But within the group um, that was getting both the story and the number, the right side of the graph. The uh, in that study, it was not significant. He had two other studies, and I, th in at least one of the other studies, it was a significant difference. So that wi with, um, so that with this, uh, so that you got a smaller effect, but still a significant effect. I think in in, in one or two of three studies. That was a oh, go ahead. That was a very, very interesting presentation. Thank, Thank you. you so much. I was wondering uh, when you talk about resistance to uh, numbers and when you really show off. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hello? Hello. There we I'm go. Um, and especially from um, a motivated <laughs> perspective, do you observe any difference uh, across the ideological spectrum? So first uh, conservatives versus liberals, for example, are there difference to, uh, between them in terms of how much, how much they are yeah. driven by motivated um, reasoning? Right, so th there's some data out there that suggests that conservatives show stronger kinds of motivated reasoning effects than liberals. We generally do not see that. We see it as fairly, c fairly consistent. There was one study, because we've run these studies a number of times, there's one study where I think we did show that and honestly didn't quite believe it because it hasn't shown up any other time. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, we're just wondering about your panda uh, experiment. Yeah, yeah. not mine, but uh, no, well Chris and Yuval. Yeah, they showed. Yeah. If I were exposed to such a request with one picture of one single panda, I would never imagine that my mind would go to one single panda. I, w I, w I would think that the, the panda yeah. is a representative of pandas, yeah. w whether they show me one or ten or one thousand pandas. So, so it ca can yeah. be quite rational to give the same amount of money whether you were sh exposed to one panda or ten or, or fifteen pandas. So, uh, whereas when you show these dots, it's more is more like math than than showing pictures of one or ten or fifteen pandas. Yeah. So the the story they told was that it was going to help one panda or it was going to help four pandas in the, in the story that, that they told. The the they were told. That was okay. the story they were told. That was the story they were told. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and honestly, I don't know why it would differ with the dots otherwise. No. Because if, if you were shown one, dots, one yeah. dot, yeah. wouldn't you think that also would have? Really? What was the explanation of the difference? Oh, th in, in that particular study? Yeah, yeah. Oh, so in the study, it's the idea that when you see a picture of a panda, yeah. it elicits, the it's cute, it elicits yeah. an, uh, a, an emotional reaction. Yeah. And that emotional reaction essentially drowns out um, mm. your thinking about one versus yeah. four. Yeah. Uh, but with the dots, you don't have that same yeah. emotional reaction. You just okay. don't quite get okay. it from the, from the text yeah. that's used to describe. And as a result, you're sensitive to one dot versus four dots. Okay. So I'm interested to hear if anybody has uh, looked at what happens if you introduce incentives to be mathematically correct. Mm -hmm. uh, so imagine that you, you tested for, yeah. for numerical ability and you have a test control group and, 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 and then both are given very, very politically divisive questions wh which though have a very clear and obvious mathematical, in the setup, mathematical uh, um <coughs> answer. Yeah. And then you introduce for one of the groups incentives. You get paid for the numbers of, of correct yeah. answers you give. And part of the reason I'm wondering yeah. about what, what happens when you do this is I'm wondering about what kind of education, how, how should we change the educa educational systems to, to solve this in the future? So what would happen if there would be more politically divisive math questions in teaching uh, children math? 
uh, would oh. that would that make That's them over time overcome uh, th this problem partly, or would it mean that? people would resist math even more. Uh, so, That's so really I, interesting. So this is sort of why, why I think this is sort of a, a really important. Has anybody studied this? Uh, Not that I know of, but okay. I think that's a really interesting experiment to okay. do. To actually look at, essentially, you're trying to inoculate kids yeah. from d being a motiv being yeah, motivated yeah, so reasoners so, so as first adults. I'm, I'm wondering what happens with adults, of course. I mean, if you do... Yeah, so I actually don't know. Has anybody... Do you know of anybody who's done... I don't know anybody who's done... Um, yeah. That There are other politically divisive kinds of... So, uh, so in a in this in the kinds of experiments that I talked about today, I don't know of anybody who's used incentives. Um, there are some studies. Um, th these are again Dan Kahan studies, where he was simply looking in the U.S. Um, at whether people correctly answered some factual problems, but that are politically divisive in the U.S. And so things like um, is climate change human caused? That is politically divisive in the U.S. Uh, and what you end up seeing is that people who are liberals are much more likely to give the correct answer than people who are conservatives. Um, but if you incentivize people, then, um, they actu pe pe then, then it's about the same. Uh, and so in that kind of an incentivization, that <coughs> seems to work. Now, what Dan has argued at least, and I was not involved in this, what Dan at least has argued is that in that kind of a situation, you are going to people who just simply have a different goal. There, um, the study was done on MTurk, for do you, you know what M -Turk, Amazon Mechanical Turk is, MTurk? Okay. Um, what he would argue is that, well, people there just simply, they haven't, they're, they're, on that, they're on that site simply because they have an incentive to earn money and now you're incentivizing them even more, of course. Um, Dan can also turn off that effect, the effect being uh, liberals are more likely to answer that correctly than conservatives. If you pose the question in a slightly different way, if you say, do scientists agree that uh, climate change is human caused? There, then also you don't get this difference between liberals and conservatives. So uh, the answer to your question is nobody's done the first thing that you're talking about, and the second one somebody should do. <laughs> I think it's very Thank interesting. So, uh, we have uh, three more questions on like seven minutes, so let's see if we can do it. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Andreas Olson. Thank you for a great talk. Yeah, I have you. a quick uh, follow-up question, I think, from the just the previous one, and it has to do with uh, the increase or the the change in numeric ability. I was happy to see that that could actually change um, by education. So the question is, if you increase numeric ability, do you then think that uh, individuals automatically increase their accuracy goals? So the, the no. accuracy itself would be more salient, would be more important. Not necessarily so, according to your yeah. data, but would that but in, in general, general be the case, that you would be more inclined to perform or to weight the accuracy goal? More. Um, so theoretically, yes, absolutely. <laughs> Practically, um, there's only w uh, one study that's actually that I know of that's actually tried to look at increasing numeric ability among adults and looking to see what happens to um, uh, decision-making kinds of things. Uh, we did a study that came out in 2017 where uh, we did a study inside a, an undergraduate statistics classroom. We, we randomly assigned people to what's called a values affirmation manipulation. And for someone who's interested, I can explain, but, but basically it's, it's in, the idea was we wanted to um, improve or protect their numeric confidence so they could learn more in the class and do better in terms of decision making. And you can look indirectly at, at the answer to your question in that um, people who are in our experimental condition became more objectively numerate. We protected their numeric confidence across the course of the semester. Uh, they became more financially literate, suggesting they have more of an accuracy goal. Uh, and they uh, took on healthier behaviors by the end of the semester. And so a little bit of evidence. Um, caveat on this is very small effect sizes. And the studies are really difficult to do. We've tried. Um, we, we, we're, we're continuing to try to do these studies to try to increase the effect size, but it's tough. Um, and so qu in a qualified yes. Uh, thank you. This also comes from education, and um, yeah. I was wondering, uh, have you seen any studies on the on the gap between uh, the uh, numeric confidence and the abilities, and how to sort of decrease that gap? Yeah, calibration. <laughs> yeah, calibration is a great question. Is is it po is ha have you seen that this is possible? Because I'm thinking in yeah. in maths education, like Joe Boulder, she's talking a lot about how. 
uh, the problem with kids today is actually not that they cannot calculate, but one of the one thing that is actually hindering themselves is their identity as I'm not a math person, so therefore I cannot yeah. calculate. And yep. I also think that this also ha has something to do with gender issues. Yep. Uh, uh, I'll, can you, I'll tell you about that. Do you find that in your data? Yeah. So um, I'll try to make this short because I know you want me to be short. Um, <laughs> Uh, so we just published a paper in PNAS about a month ago, um, and we looked specifically at uh, numeric ability and numeric confidence. Our outcome measures were a bit different. We looked at um, financial outcomes among a diverse group of U.S. adults, and we looked at the disease activity of lupus patients. We were able to get disease activity from their medical records. Um, and and uh, lupus patients are primarily female. Our diverse sample was diverse. Um, the shorthand version is, in general, men tend to be um, more overconfident than women are. Um, however, when we looked at just a median split of numeric confidence, and we simply ask numeric confidence as how good are you at working with fractions, how good are you at calculating a tip at a restaurant, um, and you do a median split on objective ability, so you can look at those four corners, what you see is that about 15% of the people are mismatched. They are not calibrated. And then about 35% each are low, low, or, lo or, or high, high, so they're calibrated. Men and women, if, if you then look at it separately for men versus women, um, the only thing that very sadly happens is that the women go more into the low, low, and the men go more into the high, high. If d does that make sense in terms of, okay. So, but from other literature, we do know in a different way of measuring that men tend to be more overconfident than women. So just a little bit of background there. Um, in terms of um, wh wh what ends up happening in this paper, and I'm hoping it's going to answer your question. Wha t t tell me again your, your, last, your second question. So how get, get studies or interventions actually to get to calibration. To get people to understand their actual yeah, so, so first I'd say that is a key question, and we don't know a ton about it. There's actually more in the education literature than any place else. Um, there's a paper, for example, in biology looking at um, a manipulation that was done inside an introductory biology class where they looked at trying to get kids to, to be, and I think it's, I don't know if it's high school or college, I don't remember, I'll, I'll bet it's college, just trying to get these kids to be more calibrated by um, showing them how overconfident they are and then teaching them some basic metacognitive skills inside the classroom. If you're interested, I could send you the paper. I believe there is more in the education literature that I'm not aware of, though, because that's not exactly my literature. Um, and in fact, if I send you this and you find more, I would like to see it, <laughs> if that's possible. A final question. And I have to admit, I'm not a number person. <laughs> 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 and uh, and uh, I'm also an organization scholar, and my name is in Anna. Yeah. Um, and we actually talk a lot about storytelling and the yep. way that it tells stories and so on. So I was thinking about, uh, you know, what I take from, from your presentation. And, and um, um, based on your result, is there anything that we can learn uh, um, on how we actually communicate research, both in terms of results and in terms of actually doing research? And my question sort of relates to, um, I'm interested in what happens when science meets art, and then there is yeah. this... Um, there's understanding that it's not enough to reach the cognitive uh, capacity, but also to engage other senses in order to make people engage. So we understand something, but then we need to do something about, for instance, the climate change. But based on your presentation, should we then focus communication research on more on facts than facts and stories in order to make yeah. people engage. Do you understand the question? Uh, yeah, although I'm not sure I'm going to have a complete answer. So I, I, by the way, switched from a psychology department uh, two months ago into a school of journalism and communication. Okay, and right. I'm having the best time talking to the journalists yeah. <laughs> because <laughs> they're all about the story. And I keep telling them pros and cons, <laughs> <laughs> you know, a little more research maybe. Let's see if we can ramp up those stories to communicate. the. Uh, I think that there are ways to tell stories that um, can better communicate the science or w uh, communicate the science less well. Um, I have an anecdote. <laughs> it's not going to be evidence, but I have an anecdote. Uh, uh, somebody from the I was talking to somebody from the Wall Street Journal, and they were saying that what they have found over time is that if they have a nice story at the beginning, they uh, they'll often begin with a story and end with a story with lots of facts in between. Nobody remembers anything in between. <laughs> uh, just an anecdote, but yeah, yeah. I, I'd love to chat with you more about that, though. I'd be curious what curious about your further thoughts. Yes. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.